um, yeah, today my, my talk is going to be uh, targeting better since to arrest Alzheimer's disease and AD related dementia. So uh, my name is Alexa Lu. And um, before I go over my data, I always, um, you know, introduce this heart, heart wrenching um, art piece by the uh, UK based artist named William Newton Holland, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1995. And when he was only 61, and uh, he continued actually creating a heart-wrenching final series of self-portraits over roughly five-year five period documenting the gradual decay of his mind due to this um, devastating disease. And he passed in 2007. So I really don't have to emphasize um, that Alzheimer's disease is the most common dementia, and it is a growing epidemic across the world, and yet there is no approved disease-modifying treatment available. Um, Alzheimer's disease has two major pathological hormones, which are amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And uh, amyloid plaques are the accumulation of the protein called amyloid beta. And neurofibrillary tangles are the accumulation of hyperphosphorylated tau. And today, my, my talk is going to be mainly focused on neurofibrillary tangles. Since my talk is going to be beta arrestins, I would like to give you some background about G protein coupled receptors and beta arrestins. So, as we all know, G protein coupled receptor is the largest human membrane protein uh, family, uh, roughly 800 members, and the most studied drug target, and about 34% of all drugs approved by FDA act at 100 GPCRs. And beta arrestin initially was identified to terminate G protein coupled receptor signals. So, uh, my postdoctor mentor's mentor was the one who found G protein coupled receptor in beta arrestin, uh, Dr. Lefkowitz, and uh, he won Nobel 2012. And essentially, when ligands uh, comes and the GPCR, it binds to GPCR, GRKs, get, uh, GRKs phosphorylate different GPCRs, and then beta arrestin comes and internalize this whole process. So that's how beta arrestins were first identified as G protein coupled receptor regulators. And indeed, there are multiple studies have shown that G protein coupled receptors are involved in Alzheimer's disease. And, um, the challenges that we are uh, face are uh, number one, Alzheimer's disease and telepathy are not limited to specific neurotransmitter or receptor systems. And amyloid beta and tau affect multiple GPCRs in different ways. And some uh, activate, some inactivate GPCRs. And also at the same time, um, GPCRs can also affect amyloid beta and tau in different ways. Some promotes amyloid beta, some decrease amyloid beta and uh, tau um, as well. And also multiple GPCRs, as we all know, are involved in neuroinflammation, which it could be beneficial or detrimental. However, we focus on the fact that all GPCRs share a common mechanism via the arrestins. And uh, there are four types of arrestins, arrestin one, two, three, four. And today uh, I'm going to talk about mainly arrestin two and arrestin three, which are beta arrestin one and beta arrestin two. So beta arrestin one and two are expressed everywhere in the body, uh, particularly high in brain. As you can see, these schematic models, uh, they share 78% of sequence homology. They're highly similar, as you can see. So they share a lot of functions, including GPCR signaling and other things. And it's been shown that double knockout mice are lethal. However, beta arrestin 1 knockout or beta arrestin 2 knockout do not really have gross abnormalities. They're fertile, they're viable, um, they're fine. And I would like to also emphasize the fact that beta arrestins can exist in three states, which is a free floating and uh, cheap PCR uh, bound form and also microtubule bound form. And it's been shown that these beta arrestins actually do form homo and heteroligomers in the cells. And in terms of AD, um, in AD field, um, the first two papers came out in 2014. So these two papers have shown that beta arrestin one uh, from this paper, uh, gay pet, uh, gang pay group and the Bartu stripper group for beta arrestin two came out pretty much at the same time, showing that beta arrestin actually uh, promotes a beta pathology. 
So these papers have shown that in this paper, beta arrestin one, and in this paper, beta arrestin two, uh, are increased in Alzheimer's disease patient brain in more advanced block stages, and also uh, overexpression of beta arrestin one and two uh, increases a beta generation. And in this paper, they use beta arrestin one naka mice. In this paper, they use beta arrestin two naka mice, and they cross these mice with APP PS1, which is amyloid beta pathology animal model. And what they saw was uh, they significantly decrease A beta levels. In terms of mechanism, interestingly, although this is the review paper for beta arrestin two, the beta arrestin one paper also essentially showed the same thing. So in terms of mechanism, beta arrestin actually can interact directly with APH1, uh, which is a subunit of gamma secretase complex, and it, we distribute the complex towards the detergent-resistant membrane and increasing the catalytic activity of this complex, thereby promoting a beta generation. However, it was unknown uh, whether and how beta arrestins pathogenically impeach ontopathy and neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease, so um, that was uh, our hypothesis. So essentially the action of beta arrestin one and or beta arrestin two downstream of GPCRs might directly impact the tau pathogenesis in AD. So this, uh, um, the paper uh, 2014 came out and then I, I was very excited and I, I went on PubMed and searched uh, beta arrestin and tau. There was no study whatsoever. That's how we started this uh, whole project. So essentially, just like Alzheimer's disease a patient brain, we wanted to see if beta rst one and two are increased in frontal temporal lower degeneration topathy patient brain. So we obtained these uh, brains from Emory ADRC, and uh, we compared the frontal cortex of age matched control and patients with FTLD topathy patient. And what we found was beta rst two levels were significantly increased, uh, both protein levels as well as mRNA levels. And we also found that the uh, beta rst 2 levels positively correlate with tau levels. We also found the same thing for beta rst So uh, First of all, it was increased in a TLD patient, uh, tau to the patient brain, and also it could positively correlate with insoluble tau. And then we move on to cell, cell work. So we use HeLa cells stably uh, overexpressing uh, tau, human tau, and we transfected the beta rst 2 And what we found was uh, tau levels as well as ATA, PHF1, which are pathogenic phosphorylated tau, were all increased uh, in presence of beta rst 2 uh, These are quantification. And we also knocked it down uh, using sRNA. So we knocked down beta rst 2 and what we found was uh, tau levels and ATA were significantly decreased, and this is quantification. Um, to prove that with a different uh, method, we did immunocytochemistry using hippocampal primary neurons. Um, essentially, we got the same data. So we transduced the prim hippocampal primary neurons with beta arsene 2 adenovirus. Uh, we saw the immunoreactivity of AT8 and tau were significantly increased. And also when we transduced uh, hippocampal primary neurons with beta arsene 2 shRNA to knock it down, what we found was the tau levels were significantly decreased. And uh, although I only showed the beta rst 2 data here, we essentially uh, got the same data for beta rst 1 meaning that in terms of tau uh, levels, uh, beta rst 1 and 2 actually share the common mechanism. And then we move on to the animal model. So in this case, we use P tau P31S um, mutant model. Uh, it's called PS19 model. And uh, it was uh, generated and characterized by Virginia Lee group at UPenn. And we crossed these mice with beta rst 2 knockout mice uh, to generate uh, PS19 with beta rst 2 hemizygous knockout and homozygous knockout. And we performed the sarcosyl insoluble tau uh, fraction. And we, what we found was the sarcosyl insoluble tau aggregates were significantly decreased uh, when we reduced uh, down beta arrestin. Uh, well, we, I only showed beta arrestin 2 data here, but we also got the same data for beta arrestin 1. And then we also uh, confirmed that with immunohistochemistry. So these are seven month old mice, uh, litter mates. So when we compare with uh, P301S mice, uh, P301S with beta-RST2 hemizygous knockout, 
homozygous knockout show significantly reduced immunoreactivity of phosphorylated tau in both cortex and hippocampus. And these are also the uh, quantifications. So, so far I've shown you that overexpressing uh, beta arrestins actually increase tau, and then when we reduce the beta arrestins, it decreases tau. So we then uh, wanted to determine the functional changes in septic plasticity uh, imposed by the genetic decrease in expressed beta arrestin. So we carried out electrophysiological studies on hippocampus slides. So we essentially stimulate CA3 uh, and then recorded the CA1 to measure the long-term potentiation in hippocampus. And as you can see here, as we expected, uh, p 3 s mice really could not induce LTP and could not maintain LTP. Uh, however, when we reduced the beta resting 2, uh, we actually could see the rescue effect uh, in terms of long-term potentiation uh, impairments in this mice model. So we got all these very nice uh, phenotypes, but then, uh, you know, what are the mechanisms, right? So it, the fact that beta arrestins regulate tau levels, so we wanted to see if it's a transcriptional level or a translational level. And we confirmed the, uh, the fact that beta arrestin 2 and 1, in fact, they did not um, alter tau mRNA levels, so meaning that it's probably, it's, it's not affecting transcriptional level. And then we also confirmed the uh, cyto cy cyclohexamide experiment to showing that beta arrestin uh, 2, we overexpressed in this case and then knock it down uh, for beta arrestin 1. And both actually have shown that beta arrestins actually significantly slow down tau turnover. So um, in terms of mechanism, I, like I mentioned earlier, beta arrestins are, uh, actually can directly bind to microtubules. So uh, multiple studies have shown that uh, beta arrestins directly interact with microtubule. Uh, in fact, the microtubule binding sites and GPCR binding sites can actually overlap. And although the uh, precise functional consequences uh, has not been really studied, um, the several studies have shown that beta arrestins can recruit uh, MDM2 and ERK to microtubule. So we wanted to see uh, if beta arrestins actually can inhibit tau-induced tubulin polymerization and also it can affect microtubule stability, knowing that tau actually stabilizes microtubule. And then once tau falls off from microtubule, uh, that, that causes a lot of problems, right? So we wanted to see uh, if a beta arrestin inhibits uh, microtubule bound tau. So uh, these are quantification. And what we found was that Tau obviously binds to microtubule, but in presence of beta arrestin 1, uh, the amount of tau that are bound to microtubule was significantly decreased. And also, we uh, confirmed that with uh, recombinant protein. And also, we did the uh, tubulin polymerization assay. As you can see here, tubulin with the tau, the tubulin uh, polymerizes really nicely, but with the beta arrestin 1, it was completely inhibited. And uh, also we confirmed this with the beta arrestin 2 and essentially we got the same um, data. And then we went ahead and did the nocorosal experiment which uh, disrupting the microtubule and see the uh, reorganization of microtubule uh, immunocytochemically. And what we found was if we knock down beta arrestin, uh, the, the recovery uh, is, was actually facilitated. So after uh, treating the cortisol, 30 minutes, we actually recover this tubulin reorganization and it was actually uh, accelerated by knocking down beta arrestin 1. So, so far, uh, I've shown you that tau uh, dissociation from microtubule by beta arrestins appear to deregulate microtubule dynamics. Um, however, the, this mechanism uh, does not really explain the increase in total tau due to increased beta arrestin 1 and beta arrestin 2. So we actually uh, focused on the fact that a lot of studies have shown that microtubule destabilization impairs autophagous modulation and autophagy machinery. And in neuron particularly, uh, autophagous in distal neurites needs to be delivered to the proximal neurites or cell bodies um, where there are a lot of lysosomes. So indeed, I mean, we all know that misfolded tau, misfolded proteins can be cleared by autophagy. So then what is autophagy? 
Um, it is self-eating and it is one of the major intracellular machinery to get rid of um, exfoliated protein defected organelles. And um, P62 is one of the most important cargo receptor for autophagy. So uh, as you can see, P62 directly interacts with LC3 and ubiquitinated substrate, uh, including tau or synuclein or uh, amyloid, all this misfolded protein. And P62 actually needs to be self um, form self uh, oligomerized. So it, it's, uh, it undergoes by PB1 domain. So it needs to be self interact self interaction needs to occur in order for P62 to recognize ubiquitinated substrate and LC3. And multiple studies have shown that P62 indeed are implicated in Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative diseases in general. And in fact, these uh, P62 mutations have been identified in a patient with ALS and FTD. So we wanted to see um, piece, whether beta-arrestin actually affects uh, autophagy machinery. Um, so uh, the simple experiment that we did here is that we used HeLa-5 tau cells again and transfected beta-arrestin 2. And we treated uh, vehicle orbifilomycin, uh, which is a potent lysosome inhibitor uh, known to promote the accumulation of both LC3 and P62. And what we found here was interestingly, first, when we overexpress beta orestin 2, it significantly reduced the LC3 puncta at steady state. And also, uh, beta orestin 2 overexpression significantly blunted uh, baflomycin induced increased LC3 puncta. And meaning that beta orestin 2 blocks the autophagy at the level of LC3 or upstream. Uh, therefore, we checked the same experiment now with P62 puncta, and then we essentially got the same data. So overexpressing beta arrestin 2 significantly reduced the P62 puncta at the steady level, and also uh, it blunted the buflomycin use increased in uh, P62 puncta. So then next, we wanted to see if beta arrestin affects uh, P62 autophagy flux. Um, so, Yes, it did. So uh, we use MCRA GFP P62 system, uh, essentially take advantage of GFP being um, sensitive uh, in low pH. So when all phagosome under uh, fuse with the lysosome, then only MCRA signal will appear. And what we found was the beta arrestin 2 overexpressing cells uh, show much less MCRA only puncta right here compared to control. And then also in terms of mechanism, uh, we found that, like I mentioned earlier, P62 uh, needs to form this oligomer uh, through PB1 domain to recognize LC3 and ubiquitinated substrate. And beta RST significantly decreased this self interaction between, uh, in this case, HAP62 and GFPP62 and compared to control, it's here. And this is a quantification. So um, the next question that we had was, how can we target beta arrestins then? So uh, I um, you know, wanted to see like how to target beta arrestins. So it turned out that beta arrestins actually do form homo hetero oligomers under physiological condition. And it's been shown that IP6 actually enhances beta arrestin 1 and 2 oligomerization. And I would like to mention that these beta RSTM2 oligomerization um, site are overlapping with the GPCR. So once it forms oligomers, uh, it does not interact with the GPCR. And uh, in France, Marulu group, he also, got uh, he also was trained by Lefkowitz group, and uh, he generated this construct essentially. Um, uh, mutated the IP6 binding site. So that these mutations, I'm going to just call it delta IP6N and delta IP6C. And those uh, constructs actually cannot form uh, oligomers of beta arrestins. And uh, they also proved that with the bread essay right here, uh, published in PNAS. So um, we tested whether beta arrestins, so we know that increased beta arrestins happen in AD and FTD and wanted to see, is it oligomerization of beta arrestins that are toxic? So we made um, the uh, AAB using this construct and we injected uh, five month old PS19 mice and waited two months to see if uh, oligomerization inhibit, inhib inhibiting um, like construct can mediate topathy in vivo. 
surprisingly, compared to control, the uh, Delta IP6C and I Delta IP6N injected um, braids show much less sarcosyl insoluble tau, and this is conification. Uh, and also, we confirmed that with immunohistochemistry. And what we found was the Delta IP6C and Delta IP6N injected uh, mice show much less tau accumulation uh, immunohistochemically. This is a quantification. So these are the uh, schematic model, um, very simplified schematic model that we made. So under healthy um, situation or uh, environment, uh, beta arrestin interact with the GPCR as it should be, internalize the GPCR. And also tau stabilizes microtubule as it should be. And when tau gets misfolded and the autophagy machinery works just fine, so it can easily take care of this misfolded tau, then you have no problem. However, in AD and FTD, um, that's not happening. And a lot of, first of all, beta arrestins are accumulating and uh, it's been shown that it actually promotes a beta generation. And uh, also, these uh, oligomerization of beta arrestins actually can block P62 self interaction. Therefore, it inhibits uh, autophagy uh, process, and also it compete with the microtubule, compete with tau to bind to microtubule. So the tau falls off from microtubule, and it gets accumulated. So these are whole uh, schematic, simplified schematic that we uh, have so far. So, um, as we all know, AD is not just a bit on tau. In fact, um, um, severe AD patients, uh, about 50% uh, or more, have TDP43 accumulation and also Lewy bodies as well. So, this comorbidity uh, is uh, something that a lot of people are now uh, focusing on. So, because of, because of that, my lab are uh, currently working on uh, beta arsine to oligomerization inhibitors. So we actually screened computationally about millions of compounds and we tested cell-based assay. Some uh, compounds show actually promising data. So now we are moving on to in vivo to test if that these compounds can cross BBB or uh, reduce the telepathy animal model. That's what we are working on. And also uh, beta arsine 1 and 2, although they are highly similar, um, they're also different. For example, beta arrestin 1 actually can be localized in nucleus versus beta arrestin 2 doesn't. So there are uh, precise um, functional consequences might occur depending on beta arrestin 1 or beta arrestin 2 in terms of neurodegeneration that hasn't been studied. So that's something that we're also interested in. And then, like I said, the comorbidity um, is an issue in neurodegenerative diseases. So we're also working on um, whether and how beta arrestins affect uh, synuclein pathology or TDP pathology. In fact, uh, that's one of the projects that my PhD student is working on. She's uh, collecting very exciting data. And then last, uh, I still have some time, so I'm going to uh, briefly go over the most uh, recent work that I've been working on. So this is one of my PhD student projects. She's, uh, she's going to be fourth year PhD student in my lab. So she has been working on this uh, CHCHD2 rare mutations uh, associated with PD and Lewy body disorder. So um, I don't have to really emphasize microtubule dysfunction in your degenerative diseases. Um, it is a, one of the most important uh, emerging pathological process. And brain, you know, being highly dependent on oxygen supply. Uh, mitochondria is critically important in brain. And it's been shown that multiple uh, misfolded protein aggregates can also affect micro mitochondrial dysfunction. And as we all know, Parkin, Pink1, uh, DJ1, that are all mutated in uh, Parkinson's disease patients that are all regulating mitochondrial function and clearance. So particularly these two uh, proteins we're interested in. Uh, so far, as far as I know, there are nine um, CHCHD proteins have been identified. And um, my lab and David Kang lab, who is my husband, um, so we're interested in CHCHD10 and CHCHD2. So as you can see, this schematic, they're highly similar. Again, they share 54% uh, protein sequence homology. And in fact, lower organisms, uh, such as C. elegans or Drosophila, uh, there's only one. So when you read the paper, uh, 
uh, when they say CHCHD10 or 2 in C. elegans or Drosophila, it's really, uh, it's really uh, referring both. And uh, both the proteins are primarily localized to the mitochondrial intermembrane space, IMS, and regulate mitochondrial function. But the interesting fact is that despite multiple uh, functional overlaps and 54% sequence homology, the mutations of CHCHD10 are associated with FTD and ALS, whereas CHCHD2 mutations are associated with PD and other Lewy body disorders. So David Hong Lab has been working on this CHCHD10 protein uh, for um, several years now, and then how it's implicated in FTD and ALS. And um, my lab is working on the CHCHD2 and how it's implicated in Lewy body uh, disorders. And in fact, um, these are the uh, genetic evidence so that CHCHD2 mutations are um, associated with autosomal dominant late onset PD. And um, recent review paper we published last year, uh, these are the old mutations that have been shown in CHCHD2. Interestingly, in, in fact, among all these mutations, 91% uh, mutations have been found in LBD patients. Still don't know why and how that happens. And uh, in fact, there was no transgenic or knocking CHCHD2 animal models. Uh, which makes, uh, you know, it's hard to really um, study what's going on in vivo. So uh, we actually created the first transgenic mice model of the CHCHD2. So essentially, we wanted to confirm that CHCHD2 is actually important in LBD. So again, we looked at the uh, LBD patient cortical uh, brain, and that we also made sure that these patients do have our best nuclear pathology in um, cortex. So we got this brain again from Emory ADRC, and we confirmed that CHCHD2 soluble levels were significantly decreased, whereas insoluble CHCHD2 were increased, and it actually correlated with insoluble alpha nuclei, which was very interesting. And um, also, very recently, the CHCHD2 T61I patients autopsy data have shown that these patients actually do have Lewy bodies and tau tangles and also amyloid flex. Um, that's why among all these different mutations that are identified on CHCHD2, we went ahead and made this T61I mutation um, transgenic. So again, we use a PRP promoter um, to essentially overexpress the human CHCHD2 T61 I mutation. And uh, they're viable, fertile, and uh, they're grossly okay. And when you just look at them, uh, these are pups and uh, pup weight and also brain size, uh, one-year-old mice and spinal cord were all okay. And then we also confirmed that they actually do express uh, CHCHD2. And we also stained uh, cortex and midbrain and found that these are all expressing the um, hum uh, human CHCHD2 mutation. And also we found that these show aggregated uh, staining pattern right here. And we also confirmed that those are actually uh, localized in the right spot where they should be, uh, which is IMS. And we confirmed that. Uh, but interesting thing was, uh, we looked at 10 month and one year old mice, and we found that these transgenic mice, T61I transgenic mice, exhibit gliosis and septic dysfunction in vivo. So we just stayed with the GFAP and IBA1, which is uh, active astrocyte and microglia uh, 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 immunoreactivity, and it was all increased in T61I transgenic models, and also the steptophysin immunoreactivity was significantly reduced, and uh, this is a quantification. And also TH positive neurons were uh, significantly decreased in these uh, animal models as well. And we also looked at the insoluble fraction in the midbrain. We found that alpha nuclein and false alpha nuclein were significantly increased in these transgenic animal models. And we also looked at the uh, co-localization between steptophysin and alpha nuclein and found that it was significantly decreased. And uh, sneptosome isolation experiment essentially uh, showed the same thing. So in cytosol T61I, alpha synuclein was way higher compared to wild type, meaning that alpha synuclein gets aggregated and also mislocalized in this T61I transgenic animal model. 
And we also performed um, mass spec um, from frontal cortex and midbrain. And what we found was overall, the uh, soluble fractions were significantly decreased, whereas insoluble fractions are increased in this animal model. And some of them, we actually confirmed that with Western blotting, tau, and the proteasome subunit, and cofilin, phospho, uh, alpha synuclein, and synuclein, they were all increased in soluble fraction in T6209. And indeed, the uh, ingenuity pathway analysis uh, showed that T6209 uh, compared to our type, the top canonical pathway um, was oxidative phosphorylation and mitochondrial dysfunction, which is not surprising to us. And then moving on to the behavior, uh, we actually looked at the high limb clasping test. And then uh, what we found was the T621I should severe high limb uh, clasping phenotype compared to wild type litter mates. And also motor road, uh, which is another indication of motor phenotype, um, show that these T61I show impaired motor phenotype. And what was very interesting, uh, so I hope this video actually do work. So while my student was characterizing these T61I, one day she found very interesting case. Uh, so she recorded with her, uh, her, cell, her cell phone. So let me play this really quick. So these mice, as you can see, are head tilted and uh, rotating one side. And then she also grabbed these mice and then as you can see, uh, it's very unstable. And in fact, we couldn't even perform any type of motor uh, test with these mice, it's just very unstable. And it was about 10% of mice actually do show this kind of phenotype. So we're now further characterizing. So we did not know what it was. So that after the lab meeting, um, she and I were uh, searching what that could be, right? And then we found PISA syndrome. So this is AD, ADPD years ago. <laughs> and uh, based on its name, it's PISA syndrome. It's actually the uh, reversible lateral bending of the trunk. So it is actually quite frequent and often um, disabling complication of Parkinson's. And uh, this is a patient uh, who has who are, who are suffering uh, from PD with PISA syndrome. So this is the x-ray. And the funny thing is, um, these mice, in fact, when we did the cognitive impairment test, so they were severely impaired. And motor tests, again, we couldn't really do it. So it's still, we don't know, it's the, it's what's a fair conditioning test. So we don't know maybe their behavior uh, what was impaired, uh, just not necessarily cognitive because they're, they couldn't really uh, move stably. Uh, but we are actually expanding uh, the number of mice to actually see if um, that's the case. So future direction, uh, we are now uh, looking at the, uh, the interactomes to see, uh, really understand the, what are the molecular mechanism of how these mutations leads to Lewy body pathology. So I didn't have a time to show CHCHD2 wild type transgenic. We do have the mice and we also confirmed that because um, a lot of people might question, oh, it's, is it because of increased CHCHD2 level in general, not necessarily mutant? I can say that that's not the case because we do have a CHCHD2 wild type transgenic. And then now we're um, collecting the data uh, 12 months and then also we are uh, aging them 18 months. And we, so far, we really don't see any abnormality. If anything, uh, it's actually better than uh, wild type. So that's not, that's a purely uh, T61I mediated uh, phenomenon that I showed today. And also we're interested in uh, comparison between T60, uh, CHCHD2 transgenic mice with CHCHD10 transgenic mice. So David Hong lab has um, wild type D10 as well as all different uh, mutants, uh, FTD, ALS mutant transgenic. So we're trying to uh, find the precise underlying mechanisms, how these similar proteins actually can cause completely two different spectrum of diseases. And then also what are the therapeutic strategies? That's what we are working on currently. So um, that's uh, uh, the presentation. So I'd like to thank to my lab people. Uh, Teresa is a PhD student who has been working in my lab for six years, but as a PhD student, four years. So she's doing amazing job on CHCHD2 and uh, beta-arrestance nuclear pathology. 
And uh, master students uh, who are now a technician and PhD student, uh, they are also contributed, they contributed a lot and also other members. And also I'd like to thank to David Kang lab people who helped me with uh, AAB injection, Dr. Liu, and also electrophysiology, Dr. Wang. And also I'd like to thank to our collaborator later. And my lab actually moved to Ohio from Florida uh, last year. So we just passed the first winter, survived. And my people uh, happen to be all Floridian, born and raised in Florida. So they were suffering big time. So they are not very excited uh, for second winter that they have to experience, but oh well, they have to suck it up. <laughs> These are my lab people and uh, David Kang lab people. And uh, then I would like to take any questions. Thank you.